Thank, thank you and good morning, everybody. The, um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, and I'm reminded that uh, Ambassador McCarthy did do my job prior, just uh, prior to me uh, in Washington, and, and she did a really good job. Um, so I'm hoping that if I do a good job too, that I can be ambassador to Lithuania someday. Uh, maybe I should just stop now. The, uh, no, really, really, it's a real pleasure to be here because Lithuania is an important partner um, for the United States across many fronts, but it's also just a real pleasure for me to be able to visit for the first time uh, such a, a, a lively and interesting country. Yesterday was a beautiful day. I forgot to bring a coat. It was cold, but I went walking around the city, and uh, it's really a, a lovely, historic city um, in, in the bright sunshine coming in at a low angle. Um, I really had a very nice time, and so it's a great pleasure uh, to be here with you today to discuss a new partnership. We have a lot of partnerships between the United States and Lithuania, and also with Latvia and Estonia and all of our friends in the Baltic region. But today, the new partnership that we're going to discuss is the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. And this is a partnership which needs our vigorous support to, to promote our common prosperity together. This agreement, TTIP as we affectionately call it, will together, along with the Trans-Pacific Partnership, create a global open trading space encompassing the majority of the world's trade and investment. And this ultimately will set the new global rules for trade and investment worldwide. And this global space that we will create together is how we will help ensure greater prosperity for our citizens into the future. So this is a critical project for the United States, for Lithuania, and for the other Baltic members of the European. But today, let me explain a little bit more about why. So our, all of our citizens naturally have uh, a lot of questions about TTIP. Will consumers benefit? Jobs be created? Will new doors open for small and medium businesses? The answer to all of those questions is yes. This is an agreement about and for our citizens, and I'm not just talking about big business. It's about you and me and all the consumers of the goods and services of the transatlantic marketplace. If we get this deal right, consumers will have a wider choice of products and services from a greater range of producers. Consumers and producers both will benefit from lower tariffs and fewer barriers to trade. And small businesses will face fewer hurdles to sending exports across the Atlantic in both directions. So here's the main idea. If we unite the 800 million citizens of the European Union and the United States within a common understanding about the rules for trade and investment, and we get rid of many or most of the internal trade taxes and barriers to trade and the inconsistent rules and regulations that slow down commerce or make commerce more expensive, we will naturally create more opportunities for everybody involved. That leads to growth, and growth leads to employment. So will this just be good for big companies or for big countries? Absolutely not. In fact, if you think about it right now, it is the larger companies that have the ability to figure out how to work through the various complex rules that divide various economic jurisdictions. And as a result, if you look at the current map of trade across the Atlantic, it tends to be dominated by larger firms. But if those rules are made more simple and more transparent, and more consistent, it is actually the smaller companies, including innovative startup firms, that become newly able to comp compete more widely in a newly enlarged market. Yesterday, the embassy uh, arranged for me to meet with a group of American companies that have come to Lithuania relatively recently. Many of them are involved in global information processing. Together, they employ literally thousands of Lithuanian young people. And these are businesses that are quite new. Just Many of them got here just a few years ago. They all said the same thing about why they invested here. 
they saw a market with a lot of well-educated, hardworking, English-speaking young people, and they figured out a way using technology to bring them into the global market directly. I also met with a group of Lithuanian innovative startup companies who are leveraging advanced technology and strong knowledge of software as well as venture capital to set up businesses that will be active in the first instance worldwide. These are not local biz businesses but rather from their very beginning real international players. TTIP will help these kinds of firms by making it easier for their products and their services created here in the Baltics to be brought to the United States and, and vice versa. So l let me put this another way. I was surprised uh, to learn yesterday that the United States does not currently rank even in the top 10 partners for Lithuania and trade and investment. Uh, frankly, I, I think that's ridiculous. It's, it's, it's strange for the world's largest economy. We're still the world's largest economy. China's catching up, but we're still the biggest. Uh, but it's strange for us not to be more present here in, in this economy. And I think we really need to work on this. The United States at least needs to get into the top 10 in the next few years. So let's, let's all set that as a goal for ourselves. But not just in terms of our exports to this region, but also our imports and also our growth stimulating investment. At the same time, I learned that over 60% of Lithuania's trade and I imagine this is the case for Lat Latvia and Estonia as well, is with other European Union partners. So that's another reason to support TTIP. Because as TTIP helps produce growth throughout the European Union, that will lift the Baltic economies as well. In fact, a key lesson from European economic integration has been that by reducing costs, by eliminating tariffs at the border, and making customs procedures faster, and simpler creates new opportunities for small businesses to sell their products outside their traditional home market. So we are optimistic that TTIP will make it cost competitive for more small European businesses to export their products to the United States as well, just as they currently do to the European Union. So dealing with complexity, TTIP is of course a complex deal. We have complex economies, large economies, many rules governing them. There's a lot of detail. Over the coming year, you're going to hear a lot of opinions about various aspects of the agreement that's currently under negotiation. For one thing, this is why in the United States we have tried to be as transparent as possible about our negotiating goals. We have set time aside during every round of the negotiation for civil society, unions, business associations, and others to give our, negotia our negotiators presentations and feedback and meet with the negotiators. They do this before every round, they do it during every round, they do it after every round. And the both the European Union and the United States have also now published their detailed objectives for the negotiations. And we really welcome incoming Trade Commissioner Malmstrom's interest in making the negotiations even more transparent. And we look forward to working with her on that and all the other aspects of the TTIP. One hot topic regarding TTIP, for example, is the area of product standards and consumer protections. And I should underline that we intend to maintain strong consumer protections and safe food and safe products because neither the United States nor the European negotiators have any intention whatsoever of reducing health, safety, and environmental protection or limiting the government's ability in either economy to regulate in the public interest in a fair, transparent, and non-discriminatory -discrimin manner. In fact, we intend to make sure that TTIP specifically protects such a right to regulate in the public interest. What we do want to do through this agreement is find ways for our regulators to work better together across the Atlantic and share information. Because the fact of the matter is that both the United States and Europe have high standards for our regulations. We're sophisticated economies. We both know what we're doing. 
the image of the United States as some kind of wild west economy is dead wrong. It's just wrong. The product safety standards and food safety standards in the United States compare favorably to anyone's. But through TTIP, we can bring things closer together and thereby make things work even better. So to give you an example, if we can recognize each other's already high standards for inspecting the quality of medicines produced uh, in each fac in factories on both sides of the Atlantic, we can together inspect more factories uh, rather than checking the same place twice. And that way we'll increase consumer safety while reducing the burden on our regulators. Unfortunately, at times, it has seemed that this message of hope and opportunity about TTIP might be drowned out by some of the loud voices that are opposed to this concept of creating wider prosperity. Thus, we really need, and here's my key message, we really need Lithuanian, Latvian, and Estonian voices from government, businesses, investors, and civil society to talk about why TTIP will benefit your countries. We need your guidance, expertise, and participation, not only to dispel myths and misinformation, but to reach out to your counterparts throughout Europe and, the constitu and your constituencies and let them know the facts and let them be vocal about them. And today's conference is, in fact, I think an important opportunity in this regard. And the expert discussion this afternoon that you'll be hearing should provide key information for you all to become actively engaged personally in this discussion. So where are we in these negotiations? I've been asked that several times. We've made good progress in the seven negotiating rounds that have taken place so far. Uh, but, we, but I think none of us are under the illusion that this is going to be an easy process because of the complexity that I cited earlier. After all, think of the challenge. This is a trade agreement between two of the world's major economic engines, each with their own independent customs and traditions, and each with a, a wealth of human diversity in their societies. Indeed, some of the issues we're grappling with have, over the years, been a bit contentious. And yet, we want so many of the same things for ourselves, and for our children, and for our economies. I was really heartened to hear that on Friday, uh, Trade Commissioner Malmstrom said that she is very, very committed to push forward. Not just very committed, but very, very committed. I think that was a direct quote. So I'll say it again. Very, very. That's great. Um, she's going to meet again with our uh, U.S. Trade Representative, Mike Froman, uh, early next month to plot an energetic path forward in these discussions. What we have before us today is an opportunity to negotiate a trade agreement that, help, that can help us create a more integrated transatlantic market, lower prices and transaction costs, and make sure that we enhance the safety and quality of the foods, medicine, and technology we use every day. And at the same time, create new and higher paying jobs. With that in mind, I really expect that both sides will accelerate their efforts going forward to bring this agreement to closure as soon as possible. Now, a bit, a bit on the global, more on the global and strategic perspective about this agreement. Looking at things from a global perspective, I think TTIP is really a critical opportunity for us uh, to set global norms for other markets and agreements outside of our borders and in other, reg other regions. As was mentioned in introduction, I personally have a lot of background regarding trade and economic policy in East Asia and in the Pacific. And it's important to note this fact, that when the European Union and the United States can agree on standards and can work with other like-minded countries and promote the wider adoption of those standards internationally, our collective size sets a de facto global standard were that big. This helps produce consumer safety at home while also ensuring that the playing field for our companies worldwide is based on those high standards and best practices and not some kind of race to the bottom uh, for global management. This is especially important given that the multilateral trade norms that were agreed upon in the World Trade Organization 
were negotiated in a different era, uh, more than 20 years ago. And some of them, frankly, are a bit out of date. So much has changed over these years in terms of technology and how the world trading system operates. And so we have this opportunity between the United States and the European Union to modernize the global uh, trade and investment system. My last point is this. The TTIP, of course, is going to have to stand on its own merits as an agreement when our legislators approve it upon completion of the negotiations. But the reasons to support TTIP, in fact, go well beyond trade and well beyond economics. The United States and Lithuania, and the United States and the European Union, and the United States and all of our friends in the, in the Baltic region, we work together on a huge range of issues, from supporting economic development, to cooperation in NATO, to efforts to fight violent ex extremists of ISIL and other groups. Currently, we work closely together to support Ukraine's territorial integrity and its economic and political future as well as to demonstrate to Russia that aggressive action will be sanctioned. Strengthening our economies through increasing trade and investment actually will underscore this shared commitment of our societies to democracy, freedom, and the rule of law. It will make our overall relationship even stronger and even deeper and show the world how well we can work together toward a common goal. So in conclusion then, ladies and gentlemen, a successful TTIP will demonstrate that the United States and Europe are still leaders worldwide in promoting freer trade and stronger investment ties. It can set the standard for a global trade and investment agreement which promotes transparency, reduces tariffs and behind the border barriers to trade, and creates new opportunities for businesses, small and large. It will also show how democratic countries can work together to create a deal which will, will benefit and give new choices to 800 million consumers on both sides of the Atlantic, as well as the farmers, workers, and small businesses that support them. Together, we face a once-in-a-generation opportunity to establish a model for smarter, more effective, and more efficient trade and investment globally. TTIP will institutionalize principles that enhance competitiveness, promote innovation, and lay the foundation for an international trading and investment system that reflects our values. It's not often that we have a chance to write our own future, but TTIP really offers that opportunity. So I look forward to hearing from you today about ways that we can collaborate together to make that vision a reality. And I thank you for your attention, and I believe I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. used very often, and it's not very often used successfully. And the reason for that is that the, the countries, the economies that are undertaking the commitment actually don't violate the commitment. So let's think then about the United States and the European Union. Is the United States going to just you know, treat European companies in a discriminatory manner? I don't think so. Is the European Union going to treat U.S. companies in a discriminatory manner? Don't think so. So it's actually not going to be a big problem. The, the reason for, so then the question becomes, why include it if you don't anticipate a lot of problems in investment between the United States and the European Union? And the reason for that is consistency. Consistently, the United States and the European Union, in our agreements with other countries, have included this. And I think we need to continue to include it because around the world there are jurisdictions that occasionally have problems. Um, right now, the United States is negotiating a bilateral investment treaty with China. I'm pretty sure that we're going to include that provision in our bilateral investment treaty with China. And I'm pretty sure that we don't want to be in a position where we, we tell China, well, we didn't need it for, for Europe, but, but we need it for you. So consistency is important in, in, this, in, in the management of, of uh, international economic policy. And, and so we're hopeful that as this is understanding of what ISDS really is and what it really means permeates the, the public consciousness in the European Union, this, this issue will, 
will die down. But I, I you know, enlist all of your support to actually study up on this issue, not by just Googling on the internet and, and finding out what a blog says about it, by actually, but by actually looking at it and then, and then transferring that understanding to others. Maybe as a follow-up question, uh, negotiations have just finished uh, in the seventh round. Uh, what is the next process in the negotiations? Eighth round. <laughs> Eighth round. Okay. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, what is the what is the process, and, and how do you expect it to reach conclusion, and when? I don't. I don't have a forecast date. You should probably ask that question to someone um, who has more control over the situation. Um, but uh, in fact, you know, I just kind of as a matter of practice, what we're going to do is go fast. I think that we now have traction. We have a, we have a settled situation in the United States politically. We have a new new commission, uh, a set of leaders in, in Brussels, and so we have every reason to just start to pick up the pace. And I think that that's actually what's going to happen. Uh, setting a de an artificial deadline, you can set an artificial deadline. They, you know, it, it doesn't really uh, accomplish that much. I think the key thing is to actually get serious and and be fast and engage in a really uh, substantive, meaningful way. I'd like to ask if there are any additional questions. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Interesting. Can you share a little bit, uh, let's say, what the U.S. business is uh, thinking about the, this agreement? And can you name the particular maybe sectors where the U.S. business see the biggest benefits that they will expect uh, to have uh, when this big EU market is going to be open. Just a couple examples what the business is, not, not the Washington people only thinks. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think it's actually, you know, really broad based. It, it's hard to pick out the, the, the European Union economy is so large and so complex and diversified and the U.S. economy is so large and complex and diversified that it's really not that sort of um, theoretical world where one, one's going to produce grapes and the other one's going to produce apples and we're going to do this, like we all learned in, in textbooks, that, that in fact there's going to be growth opportunities across a wide range of sectors in both economies uh, as a result of the agreement. And that's what we actually see in terms of the, the, uh, the presence of the companies and sectors that express interest in TTIP. It's really, it's really quite broad-based agriculture. Uh, manufacturing services, uh, the internet economy, all of these companies are very interested in, in, uh, in pursuing this and we've really got pretty uh, broad-based support. Actually, I have a question which is a bit broad-based. Uh, uh, could you explain us uh, TTIP from the perspective that it's not agreement between the United States and European Union, but it's also agreement between the NAFTA and the European Union because North America Free Trade Agreement is also United Canada and Mexico. So it's actually going beyond the United States as well. So there is actually much more global perspective here. And moving forward, it's actually also there are agreements in the Asia as well as actually Africa and South America. So we see the tendency basically that this step-by-step -step process of you know, globalizing the world economy. Well, yeah, you, you just answered the, the question or maybe you just meant to make a point which is that that's exactly what's taking place, is that the, the global economy is becoming more unified in its, in its approach to how governments manage uh, trade and investment across borders. And the, the fact that each of us, the European Union and the United States, also have uh, FTA partners, free trade agreement partners, outside of this bilateral relationship has implications for how the whole thing is implemented and creates opportunities for those other partners uh, to to utilize um, what what is commonly referred to as the most favored nation provisions of each agreement uh, to their own benefit. So, for example, the uh, a pick a, a Mexican auto parts manufacturer uh, who makes auto parts for Ford or Chrysler or GM for for autos manufactured in the United States that they, they want to ship to Europe. The, the fact that it, it will be less burdensome for that, the, the automobiles from the United States to, uh, 
to get regulatory approval for sale in Europe will benefit people in Mexico or maybe some people in Costa Rica that produce for the people in Mexico and the people in Paraguay that produce for the people in Costa Rica and et cetera, et cetera. So it, it in fact, it all comes together in, in, uh, uh, in, in a relatively seamless way on the non-tariff issues in particular, where uh, what's actually happening is global opening that's bi bilaterally negotiated. Um, we found that, um, for example, uh, when we negotiated the U.S.-Korea free trade agreement. Uh, the United States pushed Korea vigorously to uh, change some of its regulation of the automobile sector. Uh, and one of the primary beneficiaries, even before the EU and, and, uh, and Korea signed their own FTA, was European automakers because the system became more transparent and more open and and those most favored nation provisions were applied to importers from around the world. And also importers from Japan. Japan still doesn't have a free trade agreement with Korea. So there, there's actually, it's, it's called, you, know, you were right, it's globalization. It's a good thing for the most part and people need to, to adapt, and adapt to it and, and, uh, and seek the opportunities that it creates. Dallas Menas, local business daily versus Genos. Uh, at the start, you mentioned that uh, TTIP would, uh, the, the, the uh, small businesses would benefit, but would benefit most from the TTIP. Could you give some examples or cases how would how would those small businesses benefit? Um, I'll give you a specific exa example. I'm not going to name the company that I met yesterday because I don't have his permission. But there's a company that that I met yesterday that wants to sell. It's a rather small company, wants to sell a specific product um, to the United States. Uh, nice product, I'd like to have one. Uh, and uh, it needs to get approved for sale in the United States. And so he's told me that he needs to find a partner in the United States to help him get the product approval through the con consumer product uh, safety uh, system. Uh, and. Um, and that will take some time and take some money, et cetera. Uh, ideally, if we can achieve this through, through TTIP, that product, which is already sold in the European Union, the fact that it's considered safe for use in the European Union will allow it to be sold in the United States without a further review. That kind of system benefits most the smaller companies, which don't have the capital or the capacity or, the, or the, the number of personnel to go around the world to all the different markets and get, and get themselves uh, uh, permitted to, to operate in each of those markets. So that, that um, uh, simplicity in uh, global management of trade and consistency across economies naturally benefits smaller players who, don't, who can't adapt to all these different regulations. Okay, thank you. I'm Lina Viltrakene, uh, working permanent representation uh, of Lithuania to, to, to the EU. And actually, if I could ask uh, uh, two questions, because, uh, well, uh, our interest lies in, in different areas. I mean, Lithuanian interest in, in TTIP, but also, of course, the EU's. But there are two areas where we uh, um, have some concrete, um, uh, concrete interest, and these areas are energy and public procurement. So could you please um, elaborate a little bit about the prospects of these two areas to be addressed in the TTIP agreement? Energy and government procurement. Yes. Thank the you. Um, uh, government procurement first. Um, we have a negotiating group on that, on that issue. And uh, I'm hopeful that that group will, will come up with rules which will make it easier for each of us to, to participate in, in, in uh, in government uh, projects on the other side, other side of the Atlantic, through improved information flow, and also uh, not being uh, treated um, differently from the domestic um, providers of services or construction services or or, or goods for those project projects, and uh, those government procurement negotiations will be. Uh, an interesting one. I think there's mutual benefit in both directions. 
there's a bit of complexity in government procurement in this agreement in particular because the United States is a federal system and the European Union is in different from a federal system but also has a lot of constituencies uh, inside the European Union. I think we're going to need to figure it, that out. It's going to be complicated, but clearly the, the direction will be toward greater access towards those contracts. Uh, sorry, I can't give you a more um, insightful answer than that, than just better, um, but that's, that's still being negotiated. <laughs> um, on energy, uh, it's, um, uh, I think a key issue here is often relate, relates to the whole question of natural gas exports, uh, and uh, in particular, um, but energy exports in general. And for the United States, uh, for example, in our, in our administration of, of natural gas trade, um, we have currently have a system whereby uh, partner uh, consumer, consumers from countries where we currently have a free trade agreement do not need a special permit um, to have the project for export to their market approved. Um, but for everyone else, they do. Uh, now, we've been approving natural gas exports uh, at a fairly good pace of late, uh, but the, uh, by con concluding TTIP, that approval process will become unnecessary um, for European Union uh, consumers of sh shale gas or other forms of natural gas from the United States. Um, and that, I think, could be um, important for, for European energy security uh, by both you know, increasing supplies from, from a, a new source. Thank you very much to Deputy Assistant Secretary Tong for his uh, insightful comments and very clear answers. Uh, very very much. much. It's a real pleasure. And hopefully we can, we can see you here in Lithuania again soon.